Playing with toys from the 1960s and 70s were a blast. And they were a lot more fun if you played with friends. And if you did want to play with a friend, you didn't call them up on the phone. You didn't even ring their doorbell. You just walked up to their house and yelled, Yo, Tom! The windows were always open. We didn't have central air conditioning. Often, people were just sitting out on their front porch anyway. Today on Alley Pig, join me as I reminisce once again about old toys that I played with from the 1960s and 70s, including this AFX racing set, which I am going to set up and play, if it still works. Of course it works! It was made in the 60s! Yo, Fred! There are 228 pieces to this set. I thought it was from the 1960s, but I found a copyright date on this layout sheet that says 1971. Even the pen and page is still intact. You cut these out and you wrap them around a toothpick. The most important parts still look good. The cars. Before wasting time putting together the track, I need to be sure that the transformer and the cars are in good working condition. I tested the transformer to make sure that it still has an output of around 13 and a half volts. I tested the cars by plugging in the transformer and touching the two contacts together. This set comes with a service manual with a list of hobby shops you can go to for service. Included is Stanton Hobby in Chicago, where as a kid, I happen to be a frequent customer. Joining the tracks together is not that easy. You insert these metal rods in each end, push them together, and then you have to insert this plastic clip to hold the two pieces together. I think it would be better if you had three hands to do this. This took me about two hours to set up. This is a two lane track. Each of the tracks has these two metal strips running through it, which feeds 13 and a half volts to each car. I had to clean the tracks thoroughly and where the two pieces butt together, there's these little metal contact points. I had to bend each of those out. It took quite a while. And then on the cars, you have to oil the cars, clean out any dust. And there's these little springs under these metal contacts. I even adjusted those. Actually, I think just playing this toy required an engineering degree. But after all that work, now I get to play. Well, this just might take me all day to do one lap. I think we better move on to the next toy. Ah. Get the Rock'em Suck'em Robots by Mark. Do you remember five and dime stores when you were a kid? Most neighborhoods had one. In Chicago, where I grew up, ours was called Darby's. This aggravation game came from one of those five and ten cent stores. In fact, the price is still on this one. $1.88. They still make this game today. You can buy one on Amazon for about 20 bucks. This version is from 1962. It's for four players. The board does look rather boring, although it has undergone many design changes over the years. The way you play it is still basically the same. The basic instructions are very simple. Roll the dice and move your marbles around the holes in the board from the base position to the home position. To get out of the base, you have to roll a one or a six. If you land on an opponent's marble, you knock them back to their base, which can be aggravating, hence the name. I probably played aggravation at least a hundred times growing up. And you know what would be a really cool project? Make an aggravation board out of wood. Do you remember walking into a toy store or a dime store with just a few pennies in your hand and walking out with a mouthful of gum? Do you remember this noise? Ah, 
Wow! <laughs> that one's old. You can tell it's with cow. It's swell. Toys in the 60s and 70s are what I would call unitaskers. One device served one purpose, unlike the cell phones that we use today. For example, baseball, football, basketball, electric crime scanner, and of course, it's not a toy, but the calculator. But these were investments in time and money, and we played these games thoroughly and for hours. We didn't get sick of them and click away after 30 seconds, unfortunately, it's rare for children today to experience this same thing with ever-changing screens and shorter attention spans. I don't want to go up. I'm a toy just kid. I got the best for so much. Another thing that we didn't have in the 1970s was, of course, the internet. We couldn't just make a couple swipes on some gadget and suddenly toys show up on our doorstep. Besides dime stores, we shopped at Toys R Us, Sears, Hobby Shops, Radio Shack, and do you remember s &H Green Stamps? Whenever you bought groceries, depending on how much money you spent, the stores would give you stamps. You put these stamps in a book, and when you had enough, you can go to a redemption center to purchase household items, including toys. A lot of the toys that we played with in the 1960s and 70s were hand-me-down toys. They lasted through all the kids in the family and often into the next generation. Metal toy soldiers, dime banks that would only open after you put a hundred coins in, metal Tootsie toy cars. Toys were about friendships, playing together, creative responsibility. Not always with safety in mind, but we were always pretty careful. Many of our toys taught us how to use tools and solve problems. In a couple previous videos that I made on toys from the 1960s and 70s, many of you made comments about toys that you played with growing up. So here's a little montage video as a tribute to those toys. We couldn't just make a couple of swipes on a gadget and suddenly toys show up on our doorstep. Too late. 